thank you so much again. Thanks again for having me in your living rooms to talk about nutrition, my most favorite subject. Uh, the weather was crazy today. Oh my goodness. So I'm glad that by me it stopped raining. So hopefully it's dry by you guys. Uh, it's been a pretty crazy day in the news, right? With that Miami uh, condo collapsing. So it's it's been pretty crazy. Um, anyway, so I hope everybody is safe and sound and thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this is an int what I think is an interesting topic, nourishing your metabolic organs. And I want to talk about what the metabolic organs are. I'm going to talk a little bit about anatomy. I'll try not to make it too, uh, you know, teacher-like, but I think we have to understand what some of these metabolic organs are in order for us to know how to nourish them. So we're going to talk about what metabolism actually is. A lot of people, when we think about metabolism, we always think, oh, that's how much energy we burn. It's a lot more than that, actually. And there are certain organs that are responsible for that. I know a lot of us know that our thyroid gland is responsible for metabolism, and that's true, um, but it's not the only organ. So we're going to talk about the other organs, too, and then discuss how we can nourish these organs to keep in great health. So the first thing we, we need to do is define metabolism. So when, when we talk about, oh, I have a slow metabolism or, oh, I have a high metabolism, a lot of people equate that to their weight. Like, oh, I have a slow metabolism. That's why I'm overweight or it's hard for me to lose weight. Or some people equate that to, oh, I don't have any energy. I feel so fatigued. I must have a slow metabolism. What metabolism actually is, is all of the biochemical and physiological reactions that occur in our body. So we are constantly breaking things down and building things up. And the, the greatest example I can give with that would be, okay, we eat food, it tastes really yummy, we're eating it, and then we digest it. So we're breaking it down. And then our body is going to use um, some of those macronutrients to build up things. So that's why when we say, oh, protein is so important to build muscle, that's why we need to eat protein. So we eat protein, break it down, and then we build it back up. So the equation of constantly breaking down and building up is actually what metabolism is. So that's a little bit more complex than just, oh, I just don't have enough energy. So it's a little bit more um, in depth than that. Now we do know that there are certain factors that do lower metabolism and make our metabolism very sluggish. And when we talk about calories, that's actually the measure in terms of some tangible measurement of our metabolism. So we kind of know how many calories to eat. But we do know that age, unfortunately, does slow what's called our basal metabolic rate. And it slows that down by about two to 3% each decade, starting at the age of 20. How depressing is that? So basal metabolic rate is actually how many calories you need just to sustain your life. That's not even including exercise. That's just so you, know, you can think and your heart can beat and you can move from your living room to your kitchen. That's what basal metabolic rate is. I can tell you when I was 30, I guess I was like 38 years old, I had my basal metabolic rate tested and it was only 1400 calories. I think it was like 1438, something like that. So that means that I need to eat 1,438 eight calories in order to maintain my basal metabolic rate so my organs can function properly. Now, adding in exercise is always a good thing because that would allow me to eat more calories. And thank goodness, because I wasn't staying at a 1400 calorie diet when I was 38 years old. The other thing that lowers metabolism is changes in our body composition. So there's a, a lot of truth when we say, look, you got to keep your muscle mass up, build your muscle mass, because that increases our metabolism. And that is true, because as we lose our muscle mass, that actually decreases our metabolism because it, it, it the body will compensate if it doesn't have organs that, that are metabolically active. So it's going to slow down how much energy is needed for the breakdown and the buildup. And unfortunately, we are going to naturally lose muscle mass just from the aging process. We can just sit here in a chair and lose muscle mass. Again, very depressing. The other thing that lowers metabolism is if we don't exercise or if the type of exercise that we do doesn't include strength training. So that's why, again, there's a lot of truth when we say, look, you gotta exercise whatever you can physically do. But if you can do some sort of variety, 
that's always a good thing. So of course, I'm not the personal trainer, but, you know, I try to give tips for my patients. You know, I have, I have a lot that are in wheelchairs, or I have some patients that have amputations, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't exercise or be taught how to do certain movements um, that they're able to do. The other thing that lowers metabolism are our hormones. Now, we also know as we get older, some of our hormones start to decline. As we reach certain um, uh, age and lifespan, we don't produce as many hormones. Like if we are a postmenopausal, that's going to cause a decrease in our estrogen and our progesterone, and our guys are lowering their testosterone and androgens, even vitamin D. Vitamin D is a type of steroidal hormone that we know most Americans are, are deficient in vitamin D and vitamin D is necessary also for immunity and good metabolism. The other thing that affects uh, and lowers metabolism is sleep. Um, I think talking about sleep is so important that I'm actually going to do a whole lecture on it because I think, you know, sleep is really underrated. Uh, we got to talk about sleep and just how, how healthy we, we really need to get that sleep. And I have to tell you, it's difficult in these day and age you know, between the stress and we've got so much on our plate and it, you know, our, our sleep is just very disrupted. Um, unfortunately, that lowers metabolism. It's almost like our body is protecting ourselves. I don't know, maybe lowering how much energy we need or how much of that breakdown and buildup we need to do because we didn't sleep properly. It's conserving energy. So we'll talk about um, sleep um, in a couple of months. So what organs are responsible for metabolism? Well, I'm going to talk about that now. So let's talk about the brain first. Of course, we have to talk about the brain. That's the master. So the brain is so obviously so important because that's what controls every single bodily processes. But what's really interesting is that the brain, in terms of what to feed it, it really loves glucose. That is the sole fuel for the human brain. It can work on something called ketones too, but it doesn't really like to do that. So here's a good example. Just say, you know, we're eating our food because that's what we do. That's what we need to do as human beings. And the whole purpose of that is you break down, you build up. But the other thing that our body does is it creates this steady state of glucose in our blood. And you guys know that, especially when you go for your doctor's appointments and you get these lab tests and the lab test will always show you the glucose range. It might be, you know, the range might be 70 to 120. So your body and your blood always has to have a consistent amount of glucose. And the main reason for that is to nourish the brain so it can do what it's got to do. Now, for those of us that follow a keto diet, or if we have to fast for some reason, maybe we're getting a, you know, a surgical procedure, or maybe we're doing some religious fasting, then our body is going to break down some of our body fat and produce ketones. And the brain can also function on ketones as well. And thank God it's got a backup system. It just doesn't really like it. That's why you don't feel so good when you're fasting. You know, you feel a little sluggish, you feel a little tired because the brain isn't responding as, as well to ketones as it does glucose. The brain consumes about 120 grams of glucose a day. That's about 420 calories. So when you think about how much energy the brain needs to actually function, it's very metabolic. Uh, and that's a good thing. Got to keep our brain healthy. Another metabolic organ, which is pretty obvious, most of us know this, is our skeletal muscle. Now, remember, we've got three types of muscle. We've got skeletal muscle, which is our, our muscles that support our skeleton. We've got smooth muscle, which is actually our organs, our intestines, our stomach, our liver, even our brain. And remember, they still function. They still move. And then we have cardiac muscle, which is specific for the heart. But when we look at skeletal muscle, it, it's so cool because it can use different sources of energy to function. So if we don't have enough glucose, it's going to go to fatty acids. If it doesn't have enough fatty acids, it might go to proteins and amino acids. It might function with ketones. So what the skeletal muscle does is it stores glucose in the form of glycogen, 
Okay, and we, we store about 1200 calories approximately. But when we do aerobic exercise, like we're playing tennis and we're swimming and we're running and we're bicycling, uh, cycling, that glycogen depletes pretty quick, right? And then, then your body will switch to a different protein source and it's usually fatty acids. Um, if you don't have enough fat on your body, then it actually will start to burn muscle. And what's interesting is, the body will prefer muscle over fat, it's actually going to try to retain fat. So that's why sometimes it's a, it's a little annoying for my clients. They're like, oh my goodness, I'm doing so much exercise. I just can't get my body fat down. Um, it's all about different fuel sources that you're going to supply your body for exercise. And I think we're going to have some of those lectures coming up too. About three quarters of all the glycogen in the body is actually stored in the muscle. So that's good. So that's what skeletal muscle is. So that's why I'm always telling my patients um, or my clients. So if I, I have a, a client that really loves to play tennis and she was for breakfast, she would do the, she would do a match right around 10 o'clock AM and she would get up around 738 and she would be eating a high protein diet because she's like, yeah, well, I want to lose some weight. And, you know, I think protein diets are the best for that. But unfortunately, she was really bonking out. She was not, she did not have that competitive edge at all. So I said to her, I was trying to explain, well, your, your skeletal muscle that you need for that aerobic activity really needs more glucose. So you need to add carbohydrate because carbohydrates break down into that glucose. So she was a little reluctant at first because she wanted to do the high protein diet. So what we did was we kind of compromised and she did egg whites. So she still had her protein, but she also did a side of oatmeal. So when I saw her the next time, I said, so how'd you do in your match? She's like, I won. She's like, I had so much energy. I felt so much stronger. And that just made so much sense because she was nourishing her, her metabolic organ with the proper fuel source. So that made me happy. I was really excited about that. All right, we mentioned this. Cardiac muscle is only in the heart. That's it. Cardiac muscle is so amazing. The problem with cardiac muscle is if you damage it, it doesn't regenerate. So it's, it's a very, very amazing organ, obviously. We need to have our heart to pump the blood um, and it, it will circulate all the nourishment that we need and the oxygen and it you know, helps to get rid of waste and things like that. Um, heart muscle is aerobic, but unfortunately it doesn't really have a lot of glycogen. So the main fuel source are fatty acids. So what's my point in saying that? I don't mean to say have a high fat diet because we know that fats will accumulate in the blood vessels and then cause us to have heart attacks. But the energy source is a byproduct of the foods that we eat and the triglycerides that we eat. So if we're eating the good fats, it's good for our heart. Did you ever equate why olive oil is good for our heart? Well, olive oil has the good fatty acids to nourish our heart muscle or fatty fish have omega-3s. The omega-3s are the good fatty acids that helped fuel our heart. So that's, that's the relationship between the fuel source and the food and keeping our cardiac muscle very strong. Cardiac muscle is so cool. I remember when I was going through college in anatomy and physiology, my professor was able to isolate a cardiac cell. It was the coolest thing. So he had two cells, um, cardiac cells, and he had them in these Petri dishes. And obviously they pump, right? So they're, they're kind of undulating. And they were at different um, sinks. It was weird. One, one Petri dish, so you had that cardiac cell kind of pumping and doing its thing. And then you had the other one pumping and doing its thing in the other Petri dish. And yet when they put them together and those two cells touched, they started to synchronize. It was the coolest thing. It was just the coolest thing. So this cardiac muscle is extremely amazing. Um, you know, think about our heart starts to beat at what, uh, eight weeks, is it eight weeks of, of life? So, you know, we've got to keep that cardiac muscle strong because it's what's going to sustain us until the end. Now, adipose tissue, which is just a fancy name for fat tissue, we thought that it did nothing. We just thought, yeah, okay, it just, it, it 
insulates us and keeps us warm. <laughs> but now we know that adipose tissue or fat tissue is actually very metabolic. As a matter of fact, it's very endocrine as well. And that's what causes the problems. So if we have too much fat tissue or too much adipose tissue, um, it can lead to like disorders like metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, diabetes type two. So fat tissue is not inert. It actually performs functions. It also secretes hormones, um, uh, hormones to actually tell our brain when we should be stopping to eat. You know, I think we talked about this, it's called leptin, right? Leptin. Um, and that's the hormone that kind of tells the body, all right, stop eating. You already have enough fat tissue. But unfortunately, as we develop more fat, there's a dysfunction in that hormone and it gets all confused. So the body's like, no, there's not enough fat. There's not enough fats. And then we're building more fat. And when you think about it, fat tissue is very protective. Um, you know, we are genetically um, you know, descendants of the caveman days. And back then, food was scarce. I mean, if you couldn't capture that dinosaur or there were no berries to eat, we weren't eating. So thank goodness we had some fat tissue so we weren't you know, dropping dead the next day. Unfortunately, now with our westernized diets, we are just building way too much fat tissue. This is just a, an example. So 154 pound man, the 15 kilograms of triacylglycerols, that's just a fancy word for fatty acids, has an energy content of 135,000 calories. That's just to show you how dense, calorically dense fat tissue is. Our body likes to store fat. It doesn't really like to let it go. And again, I think that's just remnants of us being a very protective organism to our environment. Um, the glucose level inside adipose cells is a major factor in determining whether fatty acids are released into the blood. So what does that even mean? What that is saying is that if we're supplying our body with enough carbohydrates to make enough glucose and build up glycogen, we have enough energy, then everything's kind of in homeostasis, which is balance. But if we eat too much, then the body's going to start to convert that excessive glucose into fat. And then it goes into fat. Same thing when we're doing exercises. If we're doing exercises that burn off quickly, all that glycogen and glucose, our body is gonna have to tap into another energy source, which is the fatty acids. Unfortunately, like I had mentioned previously, our body's gonna tap into muscle tissue too. So we have to kind of learn that balance so we're not burning more muscle. That's why if you ever notice, when you look at like competitive cycling or really long distance runners, they have very little body fat, very little. I mean, you can visibly see that, but you can also see they're very skinny as well. They don't have, they might have some muscle tone, but they don't have a lot of muscles either. So their body is really reaching for the energy from no fat. So it's reaching into that protein. We are currently assisting other callers. Your call is very important to us. Oh. Please hold for the next available customer. I don't know who that is, but you might want to put yourself on mute. <laughs> Let me just see if I can, I can't do it from here. Uh, let's see, I think I can, let's do it from here. There we go, perfect, thank you. Another metabolic organ is the kidney. Now we know the function of the kidney is to produce urine and to get rid of waste, but think about how much energy that, that does, uh, uh, that needs. I mean, the kidney is constantly filtering 24 hours a day, every single minute. I mean, the blood plasma, is filtered nearly 60 times each day. So we have to do that. And the reason why we have to do that is because we have to keep a balance of the electrolytes and we got to get rid of the toxins and we have to, you know, all the stuff that's circulating in our bloodstream has to be filtered. So just imagine how metabolically active those kidneys must be. Um, that's why oftentimes I work with a population that is actually waiting for a kidney transplant. And unfortunately, a lot of my patients that are waiting for this transplant are very overweight. And it's because part of that is because they have non-functioning kidneys. Um, so metabolically, they've got a very low metabolism. The kidneys require a lot of glucose and a lot of energy to do that. Um, so that's why our kidneys are super important for so many reasons. 
the liver. Now, the liver is amazing. The liver is, I think, the second largest organ of the body. The skin is actually the first largest organ of the body, but the liver is a beautiful, amazing, just a regenerative organ. Um, it's very metabolic and it has a lot of functions. The liver also detoxifies our blood. The liver metabolizes medications. The liver metabolizes certain um, macronutrients. Like when we eat proteins, it breaks it down and then it has to go to the liver to be you know, repackaged. The liver makes blood cells. The liver is Im important for immunity. I mean, the liver is such an important organ. And I, I wouldn't say that one is more important because you know the brain's important too and the heart's important too and the kidneys are important too, but the liver has a lot of functions. So the more functions it has and the larger it is, the more it's going to be very metabolic. So that's why the liver requires a lot of blood flow and it does require that glucose and it can still work on fatty acids and amino acids but like almost every organ, it prefers glucose. The liver removes about two thirds of the glucose from the blood. So this is actually showing you where is all that glucose going? Well, it's gonna to go to the liver. When you think about people that have type two diabetes, they actually has a, have a dysfunction in the hormone that actually regulates this. So that's why people that have type two diabetes has an increased risk of developing other complications of other organs. The liver is also important for fat metabolism. So what that means is when we eat fat, the fat can't just circulate through the blood because it's too thick. So what it does is the, um, the liver repackages the fat. So it's allowed to circulate into, into our bloodstream to function. So I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you ever go and you get a blood test and you don't go fasting, so you just had a beautiful egg dinner, uh, egg breakfast, which is pretty high in fat, right? And you go and you get your blood drawn. It's almost going to look white. It, it's pretty freaky. It almost looks like there's a, a layer of, seriously, a layer of lard. And that's not a layer of lard, really. What it is, is that the body has actually repackaged some of the fat. And then when you pull it out of the plasma, you can actually see. Oh, it's, it's pretty cool. But that's why we have to usually get our lab tests fasting so um, we don't get false positive tests. Um, the liver also plays a part in an amino acid metabolism. So what does that mean? Amino acids are building blocks of protein. So when we eat proteins, we eat them, we break them down, but then we've got to use them again. And the only way we can use them is the liver has to, again, change the molecular formula a little bit and kind of change the molecules. And then this way it can actually build up tissues. So as you can see, the liver is a pretty cool organ. Another metabolic organ that most of us are familiar with is the thyroid gland. And we always seem to equate uh, energy and metabolism with the thyroid gland. The thyroid actually produces three hormones and it, one's called triiodothyronine, we just call them T3, and tetraiodothyronine, which we just call T4. It also produces calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone that regulates how much calcium is actually in the blood. So the thyroid gland does an important job to, yes, it does balance how many calories we need. Um, so our, it is metabolic, but it also balances our calcium in our bones as well. Um, unfortunately, the thyroid gland seems to be burning out in people that are much younger these days, and we're still trying to figure it out. I mean, I developed Hashimoto's disease when I was pretty young. I'm in my 50s now, but um, probably around 32 years old, I developed Hashimoto's. Um, doctor couldn't figure it out. He thought it was maybe autoimmune, but it could have also been environmental as well. There are a lot of pollutants that we're breathing in, a lot of pollutants we're drinking, a lot of pollutants that we're eating. And I know that hormones and glands are very sensitive to pollution. So who knows if maybe this was a metabolic effect that might be going on. I mean, like I said, we're seeing thyroid glands burn out pretty, pretty young. Um, and we're even seeing uh, an incidence of thyroid cancers as well, where people actually have to get their thyroids taken out. So like I said, the T3 and T4, they actually increase or regulate that basal metabolic rate. So, you know, when I got my, my basal metabolic rate tested in my 30s, it was already pretty low. So that was already kind of giving me an indication that my thyroid was probably not functioning tip top. 
Um, the thyroid also does other things though. It does regulate body temperature. It regulates your heartbeat. Um, it also helps the brain mature in kids and growth in kids. Um, it also helps some of our nervous system and our, our reflexes. So the thyroid gland does a lot more than just basal metabolic rate. The adrenal glands, we hardly ever talk about the adrenal glands. I showed a little picture of what, where they are. They actually sit right on top of the kidney. So they produce hormones that also regulate your metabolism and your blood pressure and your immune system. And they respond to stress as well. And these are some of the hormones that it secretes. So we know about cortisol. Cortisol is, we call that the stress hormone. Like when we're, we're under a lot of stress, whether it's a physical stress or an emotional stress, um, it helps the body to actually start to use fats for energy. Then it also secretes aldosterone. That's what regulates our blood pressure. So that's why some of us might be taking uh, blood pressure medication. Maybe it's, the, it's coming from the kidney not, or the adrenal gland, not really from your blood vessels. And then DHEA, that's actually a precursor of the sex hormones, the estrogens and the androgens. And as we get older, we're starting to really lose that DHEA. And that's why some people take supplementation of DHEA. I always say, if you're going to do that, make sure you visit an endocrinologist because they're the ones that should be monitoring how much of that you should be taking. Then you've got another part of the adrenal gland called the adrenal medulla, and that actually secretes the fight or flight hormones. You know, if you're in a dangerous situation, what are you going to do? Put up your dukes or are you going to try to run? And uh, this organ actually gives you that energy to do that because it secretes that hormone. So how do we keep all these amazing organs in tip top shape? Now, what's really amazing about our body is that if one isn't really functioning tip top shape, another one takes on some of the slack, but it puts more pressure on that organ. So what we want to try to do is have holistic health, do the best you can. Um, we need to support our metabolic organs by decreasing sugar. I know we've had sugar lectures before, but I can't stress enough how, you know, sugar plays a role. Absolutely. We can't have zero sugar, but unfortunately, as you've seen by previous um, lectures, we just eat too much sugar. Even if you're not putting sugar in your coffee or tea or having sugared beverages, a lot of the foods that we're eating have hidden sugars. So that's why I think it's really, really important to read food labels labels, have a goal of how much sugar to eat. I think, you know, when you look at the guidelines, like the World Health Organization, the dietary guidelines for Americans, they're even saying, look, we need to keep sugar low. And their recommendation is about 10, five to 10% of our calories can come from sugar. Okay, that's not much. So just say you're on a 1200 calorie diet, or I have to use my calculator because you know I can't do math, right? All right, so just say you're following a 1200 calorie diet and you're gonna keep that to 10% sugar. That's only 120 calories divided by four. That's only 30 grams, 30 grams of sugar per day. So if you have one orange, you're getting about 15 grams of sugar. If you drink a can of soda, you're getting about 25 grams of sugar. So you can imagine trying to keep sugar really low is very difficult in our type of diet. So it doesn't mean you can't have fruit. If you're gonna have sugar, well, you might as well have you know the natural sugars, right? Um, but try to keep sugar as low as you can. Um, I do know that there is some research to show that sugar intake actually really damages that thyroid gland. The other thing I'll mention is alcohol. I won't go too much into it, but you know, alcohol does have to be processed. It's got to be processed through the body and it's going to go to the liver. So the more we put that kind of substance into our body, the more it might do damage to some of these organs, especially the liver and the kidneys. So if you're going to drink alcohol, stick to, to what the guideline is. One drink for women, two drinks for guys. Processed foods, well, you know, they're processed. You know, what are they processed with? They're processed with extra sugar. They're processed with extra salt. They're processed with dyes. They're processed with preservatives. So they're not the healthiest things. So if you're really trying to maintain the health of these organs, decrease the amount of processed foods we eat. We need to get back to 
whole foods. And I don't just mean the store. I mean whole nourishing foods, which means that we're keeping things simple. We really are. When you look at some of these other diets from other countries, like the Mediterranean, like Tuscany, Italy, what are they having? They're having lean proteins. They're having lean fish. They're having chicken. They're having vegetables. They're having fruit. They're having nuts. They're having um, beans. So that, you know, they're not going and buying a bunch of processed foods. So if we can do that, that would be great. I know here in America, we have very busy lives. So we kind of rely on some of these processed foods. Doesn't mean we can't incorporate some of them. But if the majority of your diet is coming from processed foods, maybe we should um, try to rethink that a little bit. Saturated fat and excessive proteins, both of those. With these high protein diets, I always get really nervous because some people are eating high protein diets, you know, but not really looking at their fat content. Or maybe people are following the keto diet and not really taking into consideration that long term fat intake could actually have some effect on our health and our heart. So it's best to kind of, you know, look at what our overall diet is and then maybe start to streamline a little bit. And we want to increase phytonutrients. Phytonutrients are things that are found in plants. So even though we're not cows, we should be eating lots of plants because we're getting vitamins and minerals from them, but we're also getting these phytonutrients, which come from even the pigment, even the color of the fruit and vegetable actually confers health. So that's why if you can eat the colors of the rainbow, that's what we usually say, it's better for us. Physical activity and exercise, you know, if we're, if we're afraid of the word exercise, then just call it physical activity or do, you know, something above your daily activity, you know, do what you physically can do. You know, if, if you have limitations, all of us do, and you know what those limitations are, then you seek help to figure out what would be the best type of physical activity that I can do within what I can do, but not doing anything isn't going to help anything. Um, hydration, very important. We had a lecture on that. We've got to drink enough. Water, of course, is the best. And research shows that drinking two cups of water actually stimulates your metabolism for up to one hour. I love that. <laughs> so if we're actively trying to even lose weight, drink more water. That's going to um, burn more calories. Eat the healthy fats. We might as well get bang for our buck. If we're going to eat fats, eat the good fats, the omega-3s, the um, monounsaturated fats, the nuts, the oils, things like that. And then you got to eat key foods with key nutrients that boost metabolism. We know that chromium, zinc, magnesium, selenium, the B vitamins like B6, B1, B3, B12, those boost metabolism. Things that have iodine boost metabolism because your thyroid gland needs iodine. And like I said before, the phytonutrients. We want to reduce stress as much as we can. It's a very stressful time. Um, it has been for a while, especially with this COVID. So hopefully that's getting better. But, you know, when it's not COVID, it's going to be something else, right? It's going to be a hurricane. It's going to be something else. That's what life is all about. So we have to learn different techniques of reducing our stress. Tai Chi, meditation, exercise, um, support groups, family time, reading a book, you know, having a, an emotional support dog, whatever works for you to try to reduce stress. It's so important. Proper sleep, very important too. And you got to include your wellness checkups. That's so important too. I mean, if you're able to do more than once a year, that's even, even better. All right, so why should we nourish our metabolic organs? Well, obviously for our health, but also to prevent disease. You know, I'm in the field of preventing disease. I, I treat disease as well, but I'd rather prevent it. So if I can prevent you from getting fatty liver, that would be better than treating it. If I can prevent you from getting a vitamin deficiency, that's going to be much better than treating a deficiency. So, you know, we can treat diseases, but it's always better to prevent it. How to keep your metabolism strong? Look at your weight, you know, and, and this isn't really a weight management lecture, but you got to look at your weight. And if you feel like you got a couple of pounds to lose, then make a concerted effort to make meaningful changes in your diet um, and then see if that can equate to some weight loss. Um, definitely um, energy and how much we're eating will play a part in that. And longevity and quality of life. Let's keep our metabolic organs, you know, safe and sound. So what are some foods that support metabolism? I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I'm going to talk about some of them. 
Um, coffee, you know, I always like to put that up there because we as American population, we like our coffee and not just Americans, right? But we love our coffee. So the good thing is, yes, it can support our metabolism as long as we don't overdo it. Different teas are good for us, different spices. Um, grapefruit, which is interesting, grapefruit actually improves metabolism, but you always have to make sure it's not contraindicated for medications. Grapefruit is interesting because it um, changes this, this, I wouldn't call it a hormone, but it's an enzyme in the liver that is actually needed to metabolize some medications. So if you're on medications, just ask the pharmacist, hey, can I eat a grapefruit because I'm taking this kind of medication? Lemons. I actually knew somebody that ate lemons like oranges. Oof, I couldn't do that, but he enjoyed them. Um, berries are all good, but blueberries, we know there's a lot of research to show blueberries really, really good for us for the antioxidants. Cruciferous vegetables, again, we know all vegetables are good for us, but some are give us a little bit more bang for our buck. So cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, things like that. I'm going to give you some examples shortly. Apple cider vinegar, I did put that one on here, and I'm not talking about it as a fad diet because there's a lot of faddishness that goes with apple cider vinegar. Oh, drink your vinegar and you're going to melt your fat away. Drink the vinegar and no, it doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, it can actually harm you if you drink apple cider vinegar non-diluted. But I'm going to show you what we can do maybe to use it healthfully in our diet. Legumes and pulses, that means the beans and the lentils, really good for us for the fiber content, the antioxidants, the vitamins and minerals. Seaweed, now I put that on there, not just because of my Asian heritage, but I'm hoping some Americans could really get more into seaweed. I think it's catching on now, um, but seaweed is extremely healthy for us. It has iodine, it, it's just a really good food. So we're, I'm definitely gonna talk about that one. Fatty fish. Um, a lot of us like the fatty fish, whether it's the sardines or the salmon, the tuna, so we're into that. Nuts and seeds, we're into that too, but a little too much. Remember, we, we still have to monitor our portion of that. Lean proteins are good for us. Iron-rich foods, selenium-rich foods, zinc-rich foods, iodine-rich foods, healthy oils, water. So these are just, this is just some example of healthy foods that support our metabolism. All right, so let's talk about these a little bit more in depth. Lentils. I don't know if you've ever had lentils before, but if you haven't, be adventurous and try it. They're really easy to cook. I mean, if you don't know what to do with them, make them into a soup. I mean, that's always the easiest thing, right? Throw it, throw it in some broth and cook it. Um, but they have the highest protein by weight of any plant-based food. So it's a really nice um, substitution for animal proteins. They're very high in fiber. One cup has 16 grams of fiber. That is just so exciting because most Americans don't get enough fiber. Uh, and we need, like in our age group, we need, for women, we need a minimum of 25 to 28 grams of protein. Some of us might need more. And guys need about 35 to 38 grams of fiber per day. The average fiber intake is about 14 grams per day. Again, because we're eating too much processed foods. Um, the other thing is it's very high in zinc, which is so nice too. So one cup provides about 17% of what we need. Zinc supports our metabolism. Zinc is good for our immune system. Zinc is used in a lot of metabolic and physiological processes. It's high in folate. Folate is a really great vitamin that helps our blood. It helps our heart. One cup provides 90% of our daily needs. That's amazing. It's also very rich in iron as well. It provides about 35% of our daily needs. The other, unfortunately though, the iron in the lentils is, is a little tough to absorb by our body. So when you make your lentils, try to maybe finish it off with a little bit of vinegar or a little bit of um, something acidic, lemon juice, something like that, just to release some of that iron so we can absorb it a little bit better. They come in all different colors. I love it. Uh, I had tried the orange lentils and I, I wasn't sure how to cook them. So of course I just threw it in a soup because I figured, well, I can throw it in the soup. It just became very mushy. So it totally lost its shape and texture. So I just wanted to give you the heads up. If you're gonna do these lentils, um, the orange ones cook pretty fast and they get pretty mushy. So I use the brown and the black really for the soup, but they're so good for us. Just wanted to throw in a little lentil recipe in there. Oh, see, this isn't even a soup, but it looks so good, doesn't it? And they use the orange lentils, which is nice. 
The other thing that supports metabolism, like we mentioned, are the cruciferous vegetables. So that's that special class of vegetables that are really stinky when you cook them. <laughs> so when you cook broccoli or Brussels sprouts, man, oh man, everybody knows you're cooking it because the sulfur, you can smell it. But it's so good for us because it's got the B vitamins, like the um, B1, thiamine, B2, B3. It also contains some calcium. Sometimes we forget that broccoli is actually a good source of calcium. And it also has vitamin C. So it's not just about oranges, vitamin C too. But it has a nutrient called the sulfuric fan and that's the smelly component of these vegetables but that's the healthy component of the vegetable it supports that detoxification of toxins very good for our liver um, it's an antioxidant so it's really great for us and of course it's high fiber too so you're just really getting bang for your buck one cup is very low calorie so that's also another good thing if we're really trying to control calories well eat your veggies so i wanted to highlight brussels sprouts Brussels sprouts are really um, taking off in the market now, which I really love to see. But look how much vitamin K there is. Amazing. 130% of your daily amount of vitamin K. Vitamin K is necessary for good blood, healthy blood clotting. And it's also necessary for bones, believe it or not. It helps to keep um, this protein phosphorylated for bones. It also has a lot of vitamin C. That's amazing, 124% of vitamin C. And you know, vitamin C is good. It's an antioxidant. It's good for our immune system. It's good for our gums so we don't have scurvy. Um, it's got 13% of vitamin A. Vitamin A is good for all of our mucous membranes. It's good for our eyes. And it's got 10% of vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 is a vitamin that's really good for our um, nerve tissue. Really the best way I love to roast Brussels sprouts. It's the easiest thing. All you do is you put a little olive oil in there, maybe a little salt and pepper. You just put it in your oven at a high heat and you roast them. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. So maybe make a whole bunch of Brussels sprouts and they, they keep very well in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Just heat them up. They're so good for us. All right. Got to talk about the seaweed, right? I love seaweed because it supports the thyroid function. And the way it does that, it actually has iodine and tyrosine. And that makes sense. Things that come from the sea would have iodine in it. So a lot of people that live in landlocked states actually have thyroid issues because where are they getting their thyroid from, um, their iodine from, unless they're having iodized salt. And then, you know, there's so much focus on reducing salt. Some people aren't having enough salt in their diet. There are all different types of seaweed and all different textures of seaweed. So you have to see what you like. I think the, the let me just move to this picture. I think most people are kind of used to this one if you're eating sushi, you know, those wraps and rolls that you're eating, that's actually sushi. Um, that's actually seaweed. But if you really want to get hardcore, try to have kombu or kelp. I mean, this really looks like the stuff that floats in the ocean, but it's so good for us. And it's good for iron as well. It contains copper, which is good for our blood. And just to give you a pretty neat story, as you know, I'm Korean, I'm Asian, and there's a tradition that after women give birth, um, they're fed seaweed soup. So it's, it's really nice, it's, it's, it's a soup. And it's to give that mom that energy because she just used a lot of energy to give birth. It also helps to replenish her iron and her copper from the blood that she might've lost. It's also a good source of vitamin B12. Now B12, we know is found in animal products. We didn't think it was found in any plant products, but it actually does have a source in the seaweed, which is really good for people that are vegetarian. This is just a, a recipe I threw in there. I've never actually made seaweed risotto, so I'm actually going to try it. I usually just eat it as a salad or eat it in my sushi or make a soup out of it. But this is kind of neat. Uh, seaweed risotto. It sounds really nice. Probably has that nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, like um, sea flavor, I guess, like sea, seafood flavor. That's what it would remind me of. But it, it sounds pretty good to me. 
All right, apple cider vinegar. I actually know some people that take apple cider vinegar supplements, you know, like those little chewy things. Um, apple cider vinegar is very acidic. Um, it's made from apples, hence the name, um, and it's fermented. And because of the fermentation process, it actually really enhances the nutrients that are naturally found in those apples, like vitamin C, the B vitamins, and something called polyphenols. It's very low in calories. There's a, there is some research to show that it can help with um, controlling that insulin. And that's why you'll see some articles for people with diabetes, maybe they should be including that apple cider vinegar into their diet, helps to lower blood sugar. Um, it slows down the absorption of carbohydrates, especially if you have diabetes, you don't want that big spike up. It reduces the risk of food poisoning. Honestly, I haven't seen too many, um, that's just general. I haven't seen a study about that, but I guess that's conceivable, right? You know, when you think about it, food isn't sterile. So if you're putting something very acidic on it, that, that could help kill some of those microorganisms. So that does kind of make sense to me. Weight loss. Honestly, I haven't seen any true bona fide store, um, research on that, but it's touting weight loss. And trust me, I've tried some of these apple cider vinegar tablets that's not helping me. Decreases cholesterol, maybe. I think my biggest caution for you, if you're going to do the apple cider vinegar for whatever reason, you got to dilute it. It's extremely acidic. There is research to show or, or case studies that have shown that people have rotted out their teeth. Um, it just really burns off that enamel on your teeth. It can also exacerbate um, or instigate that feeling of reflux. Um, and it can be very damaging to the esophagus. So you definitely have to dilute it. Um, and if you have chronic kidney disease, your body might not be able to um, process that excess acid that comes from it. So I don't recommend that you do this or use apple cider vinegar if you are on dialysis or have kidney disease, okay? So I would rather you use it as a food ingredient because rarely would you overdo it in food, right? Because then it would be overpowering in the food and you wouldn't like it. So this is just a nice recipe where you can, you know, make some glazed chicken thighs using the vinegar. And this way you don't have to worry about, oh, is it too strong or is it going to, you know, rot out my teeth because you're using it as an ingredient. So that's what I'd rather you use it as. Now, selenium we know is good for our metabolism as well. And I think I've shown this chart before, but you know, Brazilian nuts, very high in selenium. Selenium is a really amazing mineral. It's an antioxidant as well. So it's gonna protect all of those metabolic organs. Um, Brazilian nuts, if you're gonna do nuts, get bang for your buck, do some Brazilian nuts, but only do five. That's it, <laughs> that's the serving size. Um, there are other products here. Let's see, salmon, you know, mussels. You know, so it is found in a lot of the seafood, which is nice. It's found in egg. Okay, so it's found in a variety of foods. We don't need that much of it. So I wouldn't go out and get a selenium supplement. Um, just get it from your food. Most of us can. Now, zinc, I know a lot of people are taking zinc supplements because of COVID. That always makes me a little nervous just because you can't take too much and it can be toxic. The upper limit for zinc is only 40 milligrams per day. And a lot of these supplements are 50 grams or more a day. That always makes me a little nervous because zinc can interfere with iron if you take too much. So that's why I'd rather you kick to the curb the supplement and just try to eat zinc rich foods. So what is it in? Well, it's in that seafood again. It's in the legumes. It's in wheat germ, which is an amazing food. So if you're doing, you know, yogurt or you're doing cereal, you're doing oatmeal, get some wheat germ, put it on there. It's toasty. It's nutty. It's just really a great food. It also has a lot of vitamin E as well, which is good for your blood. So, you know, we can get enough zinc from our food. We really can. And if we're taking a multivitamin, remember some of our multivitamins already have zinc in it. So if you're also taking a separate supplement, just use caution. Iodine rich foods. Now we know the iodized salt will have it. Um, seafood has it, but here are some other iodine rich foods, which is nice. And look at that lentils are on there. So you birds with one stone there. Quinoa. Quinoa is a really nice food because it, it's also a plant protein, has all the amines almonds, pumpkin seeds, Swiss chard, you know, so really foods that we can get, really wholesome foods. 
the iodized salt. Now, what's interesting is that some people, again, that are on low salt diets might be missing some of the iodine. So if you're following a low salt diet because you've got to control your blood pressure, that's okay. Doesn't mean have the salt, but try to substitute with other iodine rich foods. Maybe include that spinach, maybe include strawberries. Hey, maybe have some seaweed. There you go. Um, ice cream, that's always a nice thing too. So there you go. The iron rich foods. Now remember, iron is found mostly in animal products in a really absorbable form, you know, so any kind of animal product that we eat, but it also comes from plants as well, like the legumes, the nuts. I don't know why eggs is on this side. That's a that to me is an animal product. Uh, whole grains, dark leafy vegetables, you know, like spinach and Swiss chard and kale. Again, I know I've mentioned this before, it's very hard to absorb this kind of iron. So you always have to make it kind of acidic, you know, put some strawberries in your spinach salad, put some mandarin oranges in your spinach salad, things like that. Um, legumes, there you go. So as you can see, when we look at charts like this, you can see that the same foods have the ingredients and the nutrients that we need for health. And that's why having a variety of foods is always good. So really, really, what are you gonna take from this lecture, I hope? Definitely eat a variety of foods. Um, that's what's going to not just keep our metabolic organs healthy, but it's gonna give us all different types of antioxidants and vitamins and minerals that we need for overall health anyway. Keeping our metabolic organs um, healthy will actually keep our metabolism running well, which means your, our organs are going to be functioning well. So if you can at least make an effort, you know, look at what your diet is, just do a survey and see what is it in my diet that I can change, even if you're only changing one thing, so it's not overwhelming, that's where you start. And then once you master that, then you move on to something else. And I think what happens, what I see is a lot of my clients and patients want to change too too much and then it gets overwhelming or you feel deprived or you feel restricted and then it's not fun anymore and then you get off track so pick one or two things and then change it and then maybe when you start changing those things you decide you know you know what that's not really what I want to change yet and then you change it so that's okay I have um, a client that really need to make he needed to make a lot of changes in his diet he really did but we started off with just changing from six cans of soda to two cans of soda. And even though that might not have seemed so significant, trust me, it really was significant to go from six cans of soda. Imagine all that sugar, right? 25 times six, that's a lot. And the calories, not, not to mention the phosphoric acids and all the other garbage that might be in that soda. So to reduce it from six to two, that was a really, really great change. Once he mastered that, he actually changed the goal and decided, you know what, I'm gonna get rid of soda altogether. So it really led to another behavior change. It was really great. I was really excited about that. So that's why, you know, it's always my technique as a nutritionist is I don't overwhelm you. I'm not gonna to dictate to you what to do. I want to know what you're ready to change. We have to make things meaningful, that is true, but there's no sense in trying to overload you and then you don't do it and then nothing's meaningful about that. So pick one or two things, even if it just means, oh, I'm gonna try a different food. I've never tried seaweed, let me try it, see if I like it, at least you'll know. Hey, if you like it, great. Now you just added another part of variety to your diet. All right, so that's enough of my rambling. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. What questions might you have? Lillian, where do we get seaweed? Oh, you, you know, places, even Publix has it now. When you go down the, like the ethnic aisle, they'll have, um, they'll have the seaweed sheets, you know, the ones that you use to make sushi rolls. They have it there. Um, Whole Foods will have it, or of course, Asian markets will have more of a variety. They'll have the hardcore stuff like the, the kombu and, and that stuff. But hey, if you want to try it, I would say the first thing maybe to try for the American palate is the, the nori, the sheets. So go to Publix, go down that um, Asian aisle where they have all the Asian stuff, you know, the Thai noodles and all that. And you'll see they have these little sheets of nori. And you can put it in a salad. You can make your own little sushi roll. Uh, it's really, really, really good. Let me know how you like it. <laughs> okay. And who's Rita Wisman? 
Yeah, that's that's actually a friend of mine, and I did a support group using her Zoom. So for some reason, her name just keeps popping up now on my Zoom. So, so I don't know. I don't know how to change it. <laughs> oh okay. man, that was fun, you guys. Any other questions for me? All right. So listen, you guys stay healthy, stay happy. I will see you in July. And um, if you need me, let me know. Okay. Thank you. All right, you guys have a great night.